Greetings, Japan fans. Today, we are having an interview with Paul Hardesty, ex-CEO of Adidas Japan, and that's fairly recent ex-CEO of Adidas Japan. He's an old friend of mine, and we talk about his journey on leadership in Japan, the things that he found that were different here, how he developed the team, um, the different initiatives they took, a very, very fascinating deep dive into leading in Japan. Maishu, arigatouzaimasu, and welcome back to the Leadership Japan series. I'm your host in Tokyo, Dr. Greg Store, your corporate coaching and training guy, the president of Balcony Train Japan, the best-selling author of Japan Sales Mastery and Japan Business Mastery. We are broadcasting around the world from Minato-ku in the center of Tokyo, the leadership capital of Japan. These podcasts, they are designed to help bring insights, examples, and experience about leading in Japan and trust me, it is different here. If you have feedback on the show, your preferences about potential future topics, then leave us your comments. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and share this podcast. Now, we have our daily podcast lineup on iTunes, Mondays, the Cutting Edge Japan Business Show podcast, Tuesdays, the Presentation Japan series, Wednesdays, the Sales Japan series, Thursdays, this one, the Leadership Japan series, and Fridays, the Japan Business Mastery show. Now, before we get going, today's handy Japanese phrase is perhaps your friend is working in a part-time job and you're just wondering uh, how long they're going to be doing that for. You might say, Baito itsumade, baito itsumade, baito itsumade. How long, how long are you going to keep doing this part-time job? Baito itsumade, baito itsumade. Um, how's it going with that part-time job? How much longer are you going to be working there? Baito itsumade, baito itsumade, baito itsumade. This is episode number 343. And today we're talking about be an authentic, vulnerable leader to draw people to you. And this is based on the experiences over many years now for Paul Hardesty, who is the ex- who is the ex-CEO of Adidas Japan, which is a very big company here in Japan. So we want to hear all the insight from Paul. Welcome back to this edition of Japan's top business interviews. It's my great pleasure today to have an old friend of mine, Paul Hardesty, who's the ex-CEO, recently became the ex-CEO of Adidas Japan. Welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. So, Paul, for those who may not know your background, just give us a little bit of an idea of... uh, where you've worked, which countries, what you've been doing, and how long you've been in Japan, that type of thing. Yeah, sure. I, um, I started my career in Melbourne. Uh, my background is business finance, becoming a CPA. So I was the, uh, the last job that I was doing before I left Australia was the CFO of a group of fashion brands across Australia and New Zealand. Um, and after close to seven years, I just really wanted to work overseas. So every resume, every letter that I was sending off uh, was a written form at that stage, back in 1998. And uh, every recruiter that I sent a mail to, the message was, I I want to work overseas. Um, And I kept coming back with, there's a job in Sydney. I said, well, that's not really overseas. There's a job in Western Australia. Not really what I'm thinking about. Uh, Yeah, and finally I had a call, uh, and that was Adidas. Um, I went to uh, an interview in Sydney. Um, I was successful. I got that role uh, as the head of Indonesia. And, uh, but right then in 1998, that's when the, um, the, the riots all broke out in Jakarta. So they put that job on hold. I stayed where I was then for another eight months or so. Um, I then left my fashion company, took three months off. And in that three months, just by chance, Adidas called me back and said, am I still interested? And that's where it started. That was back in something like April, May of 1999. And what was the fashion brand you were working for in Australia for all those years? Uh, it was uh, the, 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 the main brand was Davenport. Uh, the gentleman who owned the company was Clyde Davenport. And we were pretty famous in uh, boxer shorts and Disney character boxer shorts, ties, etc. But we also then took on the distribution and licensing for Calvin Klein, CK, Warnerco. Um, Carhartt jeans, 
uh, etc. Uh, and we went from there. It was a great experience. It was something. Um, it was my third job, I think, um, by then. Um, but I had this urge to, to 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 head overseas. Didn't know where. Didn't care. But I just wanted to work overseas. Why? And why uh, is that? Um, I don't know why, to be honest. I just uh, my my father. He's a, a traveller, and uh, he loves to to get up and holiday and just explore. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. And I just wanted to get... I could always come back to Australia or go back to Australia. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I got this job in Indonesia and then I ended up in uh, Indonesia for five years, running Indonesia, Adidas. Uh, they asked me to go to India to fix up uh, a lot of um, corruption that was going on. I stayed there for six months, fixed that. Um, they wanted me to stay. I decided I needed a, a less of a developing country, uh, more of a bigger market. Um, I then uh, ended up in South Korea, of where I stayed for six years, I think just over six years. Um, but my, my dream country to head to was always uh, Japan. And uh, it's just a, it's a large market. It was a sophisticated market in the Adidas group. It's a beautiful country. I'd been here several times. And, um, yeah, and, uh, and every time I had that conversation with my boss in Germany, he would say, what's next? And I would say, Japan. And uh, eventually one day he, he called me and, uh, and he asked me would I, would I relocate to Japan with my family and, uh, yeah, and kick it off. And that's how it started. And that's been 10 years now in Japan. Uh, and I felt that 10 years was long enough. Uh, 20 plus years in Adidas was long enough and I was uh, ready for a change. And that was me. So if you think about five years in Indonesia and you've had, was it six, you said, I think, in Korea, right? So 11 years. And then you turn up in Japan. So when you get to Japan, what did you find was different or challenging about leading in Japan compared to Indonesia, compared to Australia, compared to South Korea? Yeah. Um, I just First, I wanted to, uh, I think, sort of be, be clear. I, 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 I think that the challenges, there's a different bucket of challenges in every country. They're just different challenges. Some of them are common, some of them may, maybe not. But I wouldn't say that in Japan there's any more or any less challenges than anywhere else I've worked, even from Australia. I'm sure if I went back to Australia now, there'd be as many frustrations as I have uh, today. Um, but try to focus on the good stuff that, uh, that, uh, that, I, um, that keeps you going. Uh, for me, the biggest challenge about coming to Japan and working in Japan was the scale of the market. I mean, Japan's a big player. I mean, it's uh, top three economies in the world. Back then, I think it might have been number two. Um, China taking that in about 2010, 11. Um, and uh, for me, the scale of Japan, Adidas Japan, was um, something I had to get my head around. Uh, I was running a Korean operation of 300 million plus euro. I came to Japan two and a half times bigger. And I had to ask myself, how am I going to, to manage uh, a business of this scale with this many people and still have the same impact, still be uh, with my finger on the pulse and understand what's going on. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that was the kind of thing that I had to get through uh, in the beginning. Um, I think language also was a challenge coming to Japan. Cons how, many, how many people? You said 300 in Korea. How no, that's no, 300 million. That oh, was 300, sorry, that how was 300 million euros. How many people in Korea? How many people in Japan? You know, I can't remember how many I had in, uh, in Korea but nowhere near what I had How here. How many in, in Japan? In Japan, we have now uh, over, say, 550 in the office. We have another 1,800 uh, staff in store on our own retail chains. And we actually 3PL our warehouse. So there's, uh, you could imagine if I had my own warehouse, that would have been quite a few people also. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, and that's, that was... Uh, the scale size was what I had to get my head around. And I also went from Indonesia, which was a 15 million euro, to 150 when I got to, uh, to Korea. Same dilemma. So again, not unique just to come to Japan. Um, but then Japan also was a focused country. And you've got the board's focus on me. Um, you know, we sneeze, the world catches the cold, as they say. So it was an important market. The focus was there. Um, but I was also working in a flat market. Um, it's not economically, it's uh, technically in recession a lot of times or for, for a long period of time. Um, Adidas was not doing so well at that point in time. I had to then manage expectations, um, but I also had to uh, give hope for head headquarters to invest 
in Japan, uh, resources, um, financially, infrastructure, you name it, um, to, to allow us to grow. And, uh, and we, we have grown immensely since, since then. We're, you know, we're over, I won't, can't really talk about how much we, we were, but we're well in it. We're in excess of one billion euro business here, which is, a, which is quite a big uh, company to, to, to be in charge of. And I was really proud of what the team did. Um, and I just, again, thought it was time for me to maybe try something different. So you've got probably, I'm guessing, in your direct leadership group, uh, probably a number of foreigners. I, I know, you know, Thomas and Marcus, etc. Uh, you know, you've probably got Japanese. I guess it must be quite a mix there. What, you know, when you get here, you've got to start leading through people. So how did you approach getting to know people and, and deal with this diversity within the workforce, particularly, I mean, probably most of the workforce is Japanese, but mm. at that sort of reporting level, there's bound to be more than just Japanese, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, when I first arrived, I actually knew the, the team. Uh, Korea is not far away, um, and we, we quite often meet throughout the year, the entire world of Adidas meets. Um, so I knew the guys, um, some of them personally, and it, my transition from Korea to here wasn't, um, you know, it was more that, as I mentioned before, the scale. But the leadership side, it wasn't that hard. Um, I think we had a great bunch of people here. Uh, but then we had to start adding structure, and there were several positions that were vacant at the time. And then it was a matter of um, listening to the current team, uh, finding out where the issues were, what they wanted to do, what the challenges were, uh, and then facilitating the solutions um, or creating and facilitating the solutions for those problems uh, that enabled us to, um, to, 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 to or fill those roles and then to work out a strategy on where we want to go in the future. Uh, and then, of course, you have to, can't, you can't make your own strategy. You've got to fit it into a global strategy. Uh, and, um, and that's where we went. Often when you have a new boss turn up in any organisation, everyone's you know, a little bit on ten of hooks, what's a new guy like, what are we going to do here, how much can I tell this guy, how much can I trust him or her, doesn't matter. Uh, how did you find the reaction maybe on the people you didn't know through the sort of global Adidas meetings mm. who were locals, but again, you're the new guy through the door, here we go again, how did you find mixing it in with that group and building the, the trust? Um. Well, the trust part is 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 important, um, but I I also I think I was told uh, by several of the senior people that at least I was coming here with a reputation, um, and there was a there was kind of an expectation that we could repeat the success in Korea, uh, and uh, which puts the pressure on, by the way, uh, and uh, so so there was there was a there was people wanted um, someone they wanted someone they could trust. They, they were lucky enough that they had someone they already you know, knew of or knew personally. Uh, same with myself. I had people I knew of and knew personally here. Um, and the rest of the team, um, once over a given period of time, you, you walk the walk, um, and, or you walk the talk, I should say, you, you, you gain their trust. And, uh, and in Japan, I think that's one of the fundamental... Uh, I don't even know if it's Japan, it's anywhere in the world. If they trust your leader, they'll follow you. Um, and not just do what you say. Uh, and then that's when you start getting um, buy-in uh, and you start sharing ideas, working together cross-functionally, uh, and, uh, and yeah, it goes from there. So you've know, got people here who've been doing their jobs quite comfortably uh, under a previous leadership. You turn up, new boss, new leader. They're still doing their jobs. Uh, how, do you, how do you rate them in terms of engagement because in a lot of cases the surveys that I've ever seen in multinational organizations in Japan the engagement score is usually pretty low and headquarters always wonders why they're so low mm. there's always <coughs> a lot of pressure to get those scores up how was it with the team when you arrived were they already very very high levels in terms of their scoring or engagement so you didn't have much to do or was it sort of quite typical that we see around numbers in Japan and you felt some pressure to get those numbers mm. up well, I've got to say that uh, those those uh, programs, those in employee engagement programs, um, for me, they're, and Adidas do them periodically. 
uh, religiously, and they focus on these uh, worldwide. But they also understand that it's all relative. Now, if comparing, comparing Japan to another country um, is not what they're looking for. They're looking for a trend, and they're looking for a pattern, and what's more important is the feedback you get from those. Um, uh, I, I did go through a period where, um, and as you said, it was one of the lower ones in the world. Um, but people couldn't understand what that, what that meant. Low is what? Now, when you talk to a lot of people, uh, five out of 10 was, um, was good. They thought, what's wrong with that? Uh, and that conversation, I, I totally agree with them. Uh, and then it got to a point, though, where our CEO was saying, um, uh, and I suggested one day, that we should explain more about the scoring system if you want to, if you want to have some more relativity across countries. And he was all for that, but there was many people who, who, who know these um, surveys who say, no, you're not supposed to. But he was the CEO, and he said, I want you to. So I stood up in front of everybody and I said, listen, you know, this is... This is, relatively speaking, what a one, a two, a three, up to ten is all about. Uh, and, and when you score a nine and ten, that's a positive. If you score six and below, it's a negative. The stuff in the middle is, doesn't count. It doesn't count to the score at all. And um, uh, once we got that, and I, and I explained uh, that, uh, for example, if there was someone scoring us a zero or a one or a two or a three, I said, to be honest... You, you shouldn't even work here. You don't want, I don't want you to come to an office where you're rating it that badly. Um, and it was a, min, a minor uh, number of people. But I was very open. I said, guys, if you're not going to be part of the solution and fix this, then you really should consider. And what we set up, a little bit controversial, was with three recruiting companies, a anonymous application process where anyone could apply for external roles because they were unhappy with the particular scoring uh, that they were giving. Um, and uh, it was controversial, except Germany thought it was amazing. They thought, why not? That's great. Where did that idea come from? Uh, my frustration. So uh, I mean, you generated that idea? That was particularly, yeah. Anything controversial is normally me. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, just I, I will take credit for this one because I was very frustrated that people would, would work for a team and it's not good for the rest of the people when you have somebody who, who, who has that mentality. Now, people who are scoring fives and sixes, um, that might be their true score, or it might, relatively speaking, as we found out, be a good. Uh, and then we said, well, you know what? The rest of the world thinks a good is somewhere around a seven, okay? And we gave, uh, we gave a mental thought to each score. And... Uh, and um, the, 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 the score went through the roof. Then it allowed us, and we didn't take credit for an increase in, uh, in the score. What we did was we said, okay, guys, this is, now we know where we are, relatively speaking, let's work on this. And we had times when it went up and we had times when it went down. And it coincided with big decisions within restructures, for example, always negatively impact. Headcount freezes, negatively impact. Bonus time, positively impacts. So there's... We, that's what we uh, that's what we did. So for me, again, comparing across countries is, I think, not a good thing to do. Um, and if you do want to score me, then score me against the sports industry um, in Japan. Um, even uh, I think someone once told me that the only two industries in Japan that is positive is alcohol, tobacco, and. I can't remember the second, but there is two that are through the roof. Now, I don't know why, um, but as you said, it's common here to be at that level. But if that's the way it is, then that's the way it is. How would you, I mean, personally, you know, having led teams in Australia, led teams in Indonesia, led teams in Korea, South Korea, how, I mean, forget about the scoring, just your own feeling mm. about the level of engagement of the Japanese team relative mm. to those other countries, your own experience. Mm. Um, very positive in the beginning until we had the, the structure set, um, there's always negative feedback because people don't often talk too much about the good stuff. And when those, when those negative um, topics come up and they are, let's just say they're not huge, 
It's actually a good thing because the people are, all, are looking for something to complain about and if they're digging deep trying to find something, uh, you're doing pretty well. Um, and the hot topics, they're very obvious. Working hours, the pressure, um, overtime, um, and they were th and uh, complications um, in in uh, authorization matrices, matrices which across you know a, a cross matrix company like we that we work in has, and it's just a fact of life. But to simplify that um, was the challenge, and that's what they were asking for. Those are the big ticket items that we were trying to work on. Uh, for me. Um, is the, is the turnover rate high? Uh, if it is, then we have a problem in the company. If it's too low as well, it's not a good thing. You need a good, healthy turnover of staff. In our retail, we took that from um, something that was very high in the 40% or something down to in the 20s, which in retail is, is very good because we want to retain the people that we're training. But it's a very transient uh, kind of industry, retail itself. Um, so again, I took that turnover rate separate to the office um, so that I could take them on their own merits and understand if there was a problem, what was causing that problem. And in retail, for example, it was a lack of uh, career uh, development and where, where do they go from here? And our retail team and HR put together a fantastic process, which started in Korea actually, um, that would bring someone from the shop floor up to shop manager, to regional manager, into the back office, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, and that's how we, that's how we improve that engagement. Um, I, I, think, I think here in Japan, um, they were, at, in the end, as engaged, if not more, than any other country that I've, uh, that I've worked in. And again, I, again I, sorry, I only speak for Adidas, and I know other people, other leaders may, may, may see a different opinion, but for our, our company, people want to work for Adidas, especially World Cup, the Olympics coming up. Um, there's a national pride in the, in the team, in the national team, which we have and sponsor. People love that. They love to wear the jersey on a, on a match day. Um, so it's, um, there's many more indicators than just uh, a survey um, but it's definitely part of what we do look at and take very seriously. Yeah, I was going to say that, uh, you know, the uh, concept of pride in the organisation is very key in motivation. And as you say, um, in a sporting industry where you can associate with national teams with particular sporting events, even if it's not a particular um, related product, it's still sports in general, it's still you know, national pride in general. That's a type of additional motivating opportunity, I imagine, mm. which a lot of companies will never have because mm. it's, you know, it's just not related to what they're doing. So mm. uh, did you look at ways to uh, enhance that further, to drive that harder? Yes. I mean, any, any um, creating competitions, with it, not competition, but... Uh, competitions within the within the company um, allowed us to offer prizes, and those prizes are tickets to the Olympics. And we'd fly people over to Brazil or London or, or China. Um, we would uh, uh, offer. Um, we were even offering job training um, at at uh, at football clubs, um, just to get that experience uh, out of the office and with our assets. Um, individuals would get to meet. Their, their idols, you know, a Kagawa, captain of, of, the, of the team, or ex-captain. Um, and uh, we always, every meeting that we had, every all-employee meeting, we brought surprise guests into, um, into the building to talk, uh, to answer questions, uh, if they could do some social media with, with people. Um, we quite often, you know, had David Beckham was always a great one to. He's fantastic to, uh, to, to to mingle with the with the staff. He would always come in and sit on our rooftop, uh, and talk to the staff. Um, he played football uh, once in Korea when I was working in Korea for us with little kids and amazing with kids. Uh, so we had that opportunity, which is fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when Kei Nishikori was an Adidas uh, guy, he would um, he would always drop in. Uh, yeah, so. And, and, and in the company, we offer sporting programs and we subsidise um, the, the fees that, uh, that they have to pay to be in part of the runners club or the, the tennis club or the mountain 
uh, hiking club or whatever it could be. So it, it, it just let us do so much with, uh, with, with, um, with the team and offer so much. Um, and uh, I mean, for me, that's, it's, it's one of the little benefits of working with the, with the company. But in, in recent years, I think Adidas got uh, very, very good at uh, rotating staff. So we have some, uh, some, some senior people working in other countries around Asia, in Germany, uh, even to the point where they don't want to come back because they're really enjoying their, their senior leadership roles uh, they play within the group. These are Japanese. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's very yeah. rare. Yeah. yeah. So um, how, I... How did you guys do that? Because most companies don't do that. And, uh, you know, I, I, used to, I used to think that my job, um, and this was way back, that my job was to find uh, a leader to replace me from that country. And, uh, and then I changed. I changed and said, we're an international company. People are going to be rotating all over the world all the time. What would be better is if we have more of, um, what, uh, let's say in Japan, more Japanese working overseas. And, uh, and that, was, that was our aim, to rotate. So globally, we have a, a global hypo, uh, high potential program. We have a local hypertension program, uh, potential uh, program. And uh, we would develop those people. They would travel the world. Um, they would work together in groups. Uh, and then they would become um, part of succession plans that were not just for Japan, but for the world. So, you know, my, my head of sales uh, here many years ago, um, a Japanese lady, she set up um, the e-commerce business for me. And we were you know, a $2 million business in 2010, and we're beyond 150 million euro now. And she took that to 100 million within four years. And um, she, uh, she had a great life in, in that period of time because things were on fire. Then I asked her, could she do something with my wholesale side of the business? Now, that was controversial because um, having um, a, a lady, a woman running such a senior position in our industry, there was a lot of pushback from accounts, customers, owners of companies. Uh, and, uh, and then she, she proved herself. Um, uh, I won't go into the details on camera about what was said, um, but she had to prove herself, and she did. Uh, and she became the uh, general manager for Chile. Uh, and, uh, and now she's one of the head of sales of Apple here in Japan. So, you know, we... we and I replaced her with uh, another lady uh, from China, which was even more controversial because I was now getting a Chinese citizen to run a Japanese subsidiary you know, of Adidas. And uh, again, she's taking up to another level. She's a star, absolute star. And you need to do that. Yeah, that is what you're talking about there is for Japan, amazing. I mean, the fact that you could get Japanese leaders to leave Japan and go overseas for a start, because mm. often they've got families here, they've got kids in school, mm. they prefer Japan, they language barrier. I mean, there's a lot of things here which mm. make Japan a more preferable location for them than elsewhere. To get them to do that is phenomenal. To get someone, a woman in a macho uh, Latino culture like Chile to be mm. the leader, mm -hmm. phenomenal. Mm. Uh, even in, as you say, in Japan, that's even amazing too. So you've really broken through some big barriers there. It's congratulations you for doing that. And Greg, you mentioned before about my executive team. Um, when it comes to nationalities, we, our diversity inclusion policy is not just about gender, it's about passports, it's about age, mm -hmm. because you have that mix in a boardroom and it really helps the business. And, uh, and I can hand on heart say it worked. Um, and uh, we have a mix of, uh, of nationalities. Uh, I think uh, what, what, I, what I really wanted to do over the last, not out of 10 years, but probably after a few years I was here, I realised that um, uh, this might not be a fantastic analogy, but trying to chop a tree down from the top, it takes a long time. If you wedge in uh, things all the way up the tree, the tree will fall the way you want it to fall. And uh, so we have, we have uh, non-Japanese citizens placed all over the business at different levels, not expatriates, um, brought in as either local hires or local plus, uh, and it has, I think, really moved the needle within the company um, to, to, to open its eyes to the, the possibilities of working overseas. I mean, th I can't prove it, but this could be um, part of the reason why now we have so many 
uh, Japanese um, uh, Adidas employees now working either in China or they're working in uh, in Boston for Reebok, in Portland for for Adidas. We have uh, off the top of my head, I know three senior people working in Germany, head office, and I've asked them to come back and work for for me back in the day, and they don't want to. They really enjoy, and their families have really enjoyed living in Germany and working uh, and going to school uh, and the lifestyle that was offered in Germany. So, you know, I think, you know, some of that thing, um, that perception of leaving Japan, um, once you get out, um, it, uh, it opens up a whole new world. We also started a program where you didn't have to go overseas for two or three years. We did a program where you go for three months. It gives you a taste, a flavour, and, uh, and we would try and rotate people uh, in Asia and, uh, and then, yeah, and gave them a taste of what it could be like. Uh, and then if, they, if down the track they decided they would like to, on a more permanent basis, work overseas, uh, they could apply for jobs. Um, and that seemed to work. Today's show is brought to you by our public courses, but we also do custom in-house programs. We do them in both Japanese and English. On the 27th of January, we'll run our next Step Up to Leadership. This is a one-day program. It's a great program for new leaders. You're suddenly promoted or going to be promoted, and your role will change. You've been a player. You've been a functional expert. You've done very, very well in your tasks for you as one individual. Now, you're responsible for a whole bunch of other people, and you've got to make sure that they're doing a good job. And you have no training for that. You have no help on that. It is thrown to the wolves. Good luck. I hope it works out. If it doesn't work out, then you probably get demoted or fired. Don't let that happen. Let's make it a great success. Let's make it a grand success. Let's get you into this one-day program, 27th of January, for Step Up to Leadership. Now, for something a bit more involved, now in May, we will hold... Uh, the next version, uh, starting from the 19th of May, and it runs for seven weeks, once a week, seven weeks, the Leadership Training for Managers program. This is an excellent program. When you want to take your leadership level to a high level or a comprehensive level, or often in Japan we're, we're backfilling because leaders are often made leaders and given no real training no real help and left to their own devices to sort of work it out by trial and error. And there are many gaps, many, many gaps. But this is a program that fills those gaps in, gives people a really solid, solid foundation to be a really excellent leader. That's the Leadership Training for Managers program. It's a seven-week-long program, once a week, three and a half hours every week. Next one's starting on the 19th of May, 2020. Now, our website is full of useful resources, so you can check that out at enjapan.dalecunny.com. You can also email me at greg.story at dalecunny.com. If you like learning about watching videos, we've got truckloads of them, over 800, maybe more than 870 now. It's at our YouTube channel, Japan Dale Carnegie TV, and we released, released two TV shows every week on YouTube, the Cutting Edge Japan Business Show, that comes out on Mondays. That's a premier business show in Japan. And Fridays, we have the Japan Business Mastery Show, a little bit of a shorter version. Don't forget to get my books, Japan Sales Mastery. That's the Bible for selling in Japan. And my new bestseller on how to master business in Japan, Japan Business Mastery. And you've got Japanese working alongside uh, imports. I'll call them imports be they local hire imports or, you know, local plus, but they're still imports, so they're dealing in an international environment mm. at, the, uh, at the section level, you know, and so that's really, I guess, for the Japanese, uh, forcing an internationalization level upon them, which possibly normally in most companies they'd never get much contact with. So did you find that that was really starting to trigger a different way of thinking, a different way of moving amongst the team? The Japanese team in particular? Yeah, look, I mean, there was there was negative comments as well. I mean, they they we have comments and feedback that says it, it takes um, it takes twice as long to do meetings because everything has to be translated. We have full, we have a fleet of full time uh, translators within the company, um, but that's an investment. I see. 
Um, we spend a lot of money on offering English courses. Uh, and, you know, I start work at 8 o'clock in the morning and I would s religiously see several uh, guys for years coming in before I was there, in a room, online, or with a teacher, learning English, knowing that they want to go somewhere within, uh, within uh, Adidas either Japan or Adidas the group worldwide. Um, and like I said, there's always going to be a negative con component, um, but I mean, when they, like I, the, the, the result of this could be that now people are wanting to travel more and to, to get out of uh, their comfort zone and try out a different country. It could be part of that that helped change their mind. I don't know. Innovation is always one of the issues in Japan because it tends to be everyone in their comfort zone, as you mentioned, doing the same things in the same way and getting the same results and quite comfortable with that because they're competent and confident in their current role. They don't make mistakes. This is a no-mistake culture. Mm. So the best way to make no mistakes is do nothing new mm. or challenging or different because that's where there's going to be a problem. Mm. So uh, how do you get around that mentality here of you know, play within the, the lines, uh, don't uh, put your head above the parapet, keep a low profile, mm. uh, don't volunteer, don't take on anything risky, protect your uh, reputation, you know, black mark in the HR, you know, book if you made a mistake. How do you get around those sorts of issues to get people to step up and come up with ideas mm. uh, as one level? The other part of that question I want to ask you is how do you get your ideas, related question, down to the people at the bottom? Because mm. you're operating a big organisation, you're at the top, you've got your direct reports, you've got middle management. How do you know that the things you want are actually happening at the bottom. So we'll do a two-part question. Mm. So first part, let's talk about the innovation and let's talk about how do you drive change down to the bottom. So how do you, did you find the innovation component within the company? Mm. Um, change was a tough... Change was a, probably the, the toughest um, topic for me or my experience in Japan. Um, because... Uh, just the unwillingness to change, as you said, it works. Um, if I keep doing it, um, I won't get into any trouble. Um, and it's, uh, I don't know if, it, if, it's a, if it's a mentality of it's easy, it's not that. It's why change it, there's no need to. And if you don't know an alternative, then it, it does, it's, a nil, it's a nil topic. Um, and then when you have new leadership, and then I changed my leadership team over the time, People start asking questions and developing new ideas. Um, and as you said, though, a lot of people um, don't want to uh, be that rusty nail to put their, uh, put their head up. Um, so we started off a long time ago with, you know, the innovation box, the ideas box. Um, then there would be put your name on it or don't put your name on it. Uh, then we'd offer prizes. And the prizes do work. When you're saying, you know, the best idea will, you know, get a bonus or additional bonus or maybe um, go to the Olympics or do something, uh, it helps. But then we did get feedback that when that person had an idea, somehow that person became responsible for implementing that particular idea. Uh, and not always is that idea about your department. Uh, and, uh, and over time, we, we actually created a, uh, what we, a, a department that reported directly to me, and that was business development. And that business development department, it actually exists. Um, it was being rolled out across the world. Our, our CSO in Germany, he, he loved um, this particular setup. And once I, once I uh, did it, I can't believe I survived without it. Um, and these people, the, this group report to me, and they look after all project management. They look after strategy. Um, they look after marketplace uh, in Intel. Uh, they run all my meetings. They 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 coordinate a project. So, what happened then was any big project was classified as strategic, midterm, maybe long term, something like that. Um, anything that was strategic would then be handed to this business development uh, team. Uh, they would then drive that cross functionally across the business, and so you you now have um, the responsibility is um, spread. It's now very close to me, so I have direct access to that. Kind of answers your second question. Um, 
And, uh, and, and that, I've got to say, is if I work at any other company, that's the first thing I'll do is make sure I've got some type of business development. They're not going out looking for um, business outside the outside. If I had an idea, they could investigate it, then pass it to sales. That would happen. They'd incubate it, and then they would hand it over. Not uh, invented here. It's the global phenomenon, you know, of having some bright spark in a section come up with a very good idea, but that section going, we didn't think of it, so therefore it's not mm. a good idea. And in fact, it's a bit embarrassing that we didn't think about it, so we're going to kill it uh, because we don't like the embarrassment. Mm. So how did you get around that problem of having a business development team coming up with ideas or harvesting ideas or incorporating ideas and then getting the sections to actually deliver on it? Mm. That's a good point. Um, to be honest, the not, not invented here syndrome, I found in my time was more from Germany, not necessarily from Japan. Uh, and the, the, the issue or the, the interesting thing is that uh, if it comes to product, Japan is somewhere between three and five years ahead in its um, innovation. Uh, and in Japan, we're lucky enough to have our own uh, creation team. We've always had it. And we design, develop, um, or they design and develop a uh, product for Japan, in Japan, for Japanese. Now, it's very edgy. It has different f technical fabrics. Um, and, and sometimes, back in the day, we would get in trouble for developing these products because it would not be in line with what, uh, you know, what Germany creation was uh, thinking about or Portland creation was thinking about. Um, they would then, you know, come to Japan, uh, tell us to stop doing it, and then load up their suitcases with samples and go back because they love wearing it themselves because it's very unique. Um, and one of the funniest, uh, one of the funniest uh, stories was that uh, Adidas Japan launched uh, Adidas denim jeans once and they were caned for it, and they were quickly taken off the market after one or two seasons, let's say. Um, two years later, Global launched it. And, and, I, and I said to my boss, why, why did you give us such a hard time? And in, in, you know, I can always, I know his answer's gonna be, it's gonna be, because it wasn't the right time back then. Now is the right time, okay? And I think he says it with a bit of tongue in cheek. Um, so there was a lot of that. Then we were told uh, quite often, to, to what to do, and the Japanese team came to me and said, why are they always telling us what to do when we're number one in Japan and, num and Nike's number two? And when it's the other way around in those countries, the countries that are telling us what to do. And I said, it's a fair question. It's a fair question. Um, but then there's sometimes when, um, again, you they'll keep on doing what they're doing, and all of a sudden when things, you have to react. And when things turned uh, south, or sour, um, that the reaction of the team here in Japan, they kept doing the same thing. And my motto always was, and I must say it a hundred times a year at a meeting, is that you know for me, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. Okay, uh, and when I came here, 2010 to 15, our um, our strategic business plan was called changing the game. And then the global one from 16 to 20 is creating the new, which was a great lead on from changing the game. And it was everything we had to, we had to convince everyone that you need to change. Now we went through some tough times, okay? Um, and when they were complaining about um, things that we had to do or drop or what, I said, well guys, we're actually not performing right now in that particular area. Why do you want to keep doing the same thing? Okay? Uh, and that, you had to show that it's tough when you're doing something that they want you to stop, but it's successful. Denim jeans, for example. And it's frustrating when it comes back two years later um, and it's made in Germany. That's, but more often than not, it's the other way, is that um, it's, uh, you know, the reaction time in Japan was never, never so quick. Uh, and it would, it would, the change part, uh, it was a dirty word change and uh, that we had to be on top of that all the time and that business development department was always a great tool for me to get ideas out of my head and out of the executive team's head onto paper into the business and then quick feedback so and you know, we talked before about you know at the top level you're on the you know steering wheel here strategic direction driving the business you're hoping that things are permeating all the way down to the bottom 
So how do you know that the people at the bottom fully understand the direction of the company, vision, mission, mm. values, that type of directional thing? And also, how do they know what you think about the fact that they were told to stop making jeans, which was actually a good idea, mm. and two years later it was proven to be a good idea, and still maintain their enthusiasm for innovation, you know, and keep going in mm. spite of that. So how do you get that down at the bottom level? Because your scale, as you saw about before, means your direct reports are controlling big chunks of the business and below them, middle management controlling big chunks of the business. Only so many hours in the day, you've got headquarters, you've got global, you've got a lot of things going on in your life. How do you make sure you've got a pulse and the people at the bottom have that sort of feeling that, hey, you know, Paul understands what I'm doing is important. You know, he's explaining to me why our, our denim innovation didn't go forward but now it's come back and da-da. How do you do that? Um, I would say that we have quarterly all-employee meetings mm -hmm. and it's compulsory that you have to attend. Uh, even to the point where sometimes I go walking the floor to see who's not at the meetings. And uh, because people would complain about stuff uh, in surveys that was discussed in these, that they weren't informed, okay? Uh, so then, um, number one, that's a great forum to, to, to we do two, three hours, um, once a quarter. And, uh, and we explain to people, now I have to be careful in that I can't be, if the board's made a decision I need to support what the board have said. Now, okay, jeans is not a board decision. That's a different level. Um, so I could talk about that. And tongue in cheek, I would bring that up, okay? Uh, but, you know, so, so that's my forum to make sure that uh, I can communicate anything I need to communicate. Uh, we get, actually, a lot of the team to come up and present also, uh, not just the, uh, just not just me for two or three hours. Uh, and then in the surveys, we, we uh, in the engagement surveys, we, that changes. There's core questions, then there's this floating two or three questions. And it is, do you know the mission vision of the company? Do you know our strategic blah, blah, blah? And, and then we get people to score. And then if we see a, you're always gonna have people that say no or, or mark low. But if you see a big, a big swing, then you know there's a big problem. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's just a couple of the tools. My, my door's always open. Um, I used to meet every... Do people anyone, come through the door? They though? do, they do, yeah, yeah. Not, not as often as I thought that would happen. Um, we did a mentoring program, and I, I went through the course to be a mentor, and then, of course, not many people selected me to be their mentor because mm. they're all scared. I don't know why. Uh, but then when we did, it was great. It was good fun. Um, and I'm hoping that the communication we had with each other they went and told other people. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, and I've I got to say, I learned so much, um, um, I, you know, the whole drinking after work thing, uh, I, I did it at the beginning, but not such a big, not such a big thing, uh, I think, anymore these days. There's other ways to achieve that. Um, I don't, I'm not against it, um, but I've got to say, he's doing that five days a week when you've got 500 people, you're never going to cover every base. I used to have a lunch every uh, three weeks with newcomers. And so every newcomer, we had a pizza, pizza lunch. And we'd always have between 10 and 20 in a room. Uh, and it was there, it was there, there was five questions. We'd ask those questions and they would answer. And it was for them to get to know each other also because they're all from different departments. Uh, and then they had to ask me the same five questions. And then I had to be honest about my response too. So, and uh, yeah. So that's a big trust builder, isn't it? Because yeah. uh, you are bringing them in, they're new, they're meeting you, they're having some personal touch with you, uh, they're being asked something, you've got to answer the same question. So that's a very even you know, way of doing things, very mm. fair, I would say, way mm. of doing things, which people probably, if they're Japanese, would never imagine that they'd be having pizza lunch with the president for a start, <laughs> let alone uh, having him answer the same questions they've had to answer. That's quite, yeah. I am sure, for Japanese, quite, wow, this is such a different company. Mm. I'll tell you, I learned in recent years, it's something I've done all my life, but I learned in the recent, in the recent years that it has it made a difference, and, and it was unbeknowings to me in that just my personality that I share a lot of personal stuff. Um, I open up, you know, maybe an all-employee meeting with a photo of my wife and my son and and some silly photo with a dog, uh, and maybe a story about the dog. 
Um, and then everyone in the company starts asking me about the dog. In the elevator, how's the dog today? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I realised that, that, um, that sharing a lot of personal stuff um, really helps the, 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 to break down or the engagement between me and uh, whoever I've been talking to. Uh, you, you become learn, more vulnerable. How did you learn I, that? No, I didn't know. Because I got told. Oh, you got told? I got you told, know. so I was doing did you it. Do that? No, no, I was told, and I'd already been doing it all my life because it's just me. Oh, okay. And then I got told it's, it's, um, it's really, uh, ha, ha, I can't remember the exact words they use, but um, they really appreciated the fact that I was opening up, mm-hmm. and it was a big deal mm-hmm. that I was sharing such personal mm-hmm. uh, information uh, with everybody. Uh, which I kind of thought was normal, um, but I spent I spent more time with them than I do with my family, you know. So y- you want to I want everybody to know each other, uh, and um, yeah, it was an interesting an interesting revelation, say in the last five years. Um, but the other fifteen or the rest of my working career, I did it anyway, uh, and I, I now I'm I probably do it more, and I'm more conscious of m- myself doing it now because I know it works. I grew up in an era in Australia where uh, bosses were sort of above the clouds and, you know, uh, you could never imagine having a personal relationship with your bosses because they were scary individuals and, uh, uh, you know, company businesses here, private businesses over here, you don't mix the two, it was all very, you know, segregated. And so uh, coming up through that uh, philosophy, the concept of sharing personal information, family information. I'm wondering, for perhaps a lot of people uh, taking in this program, that's something that may not have occurred to them. Mm. They may be actually like I was, and probably still am, mm. if I'm honest, about sharing personal stuff. And there may be something in Japan where there's an appetite uh, to have that little bit of personal touch with the boss and have a, you know, you're not this sort of granite rock, uh, you know, impenetrable individual. Mm. You're an actual human being and you have family and you have dogs and you have issues too and they can relate to you more. So maybe it's an encouragement to a lot of people taking this program in to think about how they can make them. It's not saying necessarily vulnerable, inverted commas, but often as the boss you think you've got to be this invulnerable super person, but maybe you don't. And maybe what you're telling us is that actually that's possibly true. You don't have to be like that. That's right. I mean, it's funny. Elevator talk is a great spot and uh, you, you just quickly say hello to someone then especially on a Monday, quite often they'll say, uh, oh, Paul son, so what did you do on the weekend? And um, I don't know what they're expecting, but I, I love gardening and I, and I love to do things around my house. I'm a bit of a renovator and uh, created that way. And y- y- the reaction that I would be daring to do gardening um, or playing with my dog, you know, down at the river or at the park, at Yogi Park, it's, it's, it's surprising to me that, uh, you know, they're looking at me that way as like, I never expected that from you, but what else? You know, what else? We are all in the same boat. Um, it's just that my title, and I'm a lot older, and uh, I went to a different. Uh, I went through a different path, and I got to where I am. And you do it too one day. Uh, and I, you shouldn't stop whatever you're doing on this weekend in ten years when you're, uh, if you're the CEO of Adidas or any other company. What you do, what you enjoy, you do. So I've asked you a number of questions about leadership, Paul. There's nothing I haven't thought to ask you that I should have asked you. No, no. I, um, I think, I think, uh, I just want to reinforce that I don't, I don't think that Japan is uh, so different and so much more. It's got its own, you know, its own flavors, uh, but it's just a beautiful country and. Uh, um, you know, one of the things that we all love about Japan, right, the serenity, the calmness, and the, it's a safe environment, etc. and we love doing business here. Um, sometimes in the office, the things you want to take away um, would also impact, if you could just magically take some of those things away, it would change Japan. And I just think you need to, you know, the stuff that we love, and I just think that we need to be careful what we wish for, uh, and manage uh, our business with, uh, you know, with the environment we have, um, and uh, and 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 you can use it to your advantage. You can use it to your. Advantage. I mean, like I said, you get trust in Japan, and loyalty is amazing. Um, 
a lot probably better than a lot of other countries that I've worked in. So get that trust and you'll get things done. So if you had to give some, say, three pieces of advice, roughly three pieces of advice to someone about to take up an assignment in Japan or they've arrived on a new assignment and they don't know Japan, you've been here 10 years, you know, you're, you're a veteran of Japan. What would be a couple of pieces of advice you'd give to a newbie, someone who's just starting out? Mm. Um, this is the one I had to think of because it's been a long time since, uh, you know, since I uh, started in Japan. But the one thing, one, one, number one would be don't be brainwashed by uh, some, of the, um, uh, some of the things you're told when you first arrive in Japan, okay? Um, you can't do this in Japan or you can't do that in Japan. Or in Japan, you should do it this way. Um, uh, one, one of the, I mean, it's not a nice topic to bring up, but one of the very first things you get told in Japan is you can't uh, fire somebody. Now, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Of course you can. You just got to do it in the right way, okay? And you have to have good reason, and so you should. Um, so don't be brainwashed by um, other foreigners who are, either new to the country or and have heard this or have been here a long time and really believe in it, I, I just don't think it's a good way to, to start your, your mindset when you come into the country. You could end up heading down the wrong path. Um, uh, that, um, as I've mentioned many times, it, there, there is as many challenges in Japan as in any other country, okay? Don't focus on all of those bad things um, because the bucket of good things is quite big. And it, it makes living and working in Japan uh, and raising a family in Japan and, and, uh, and building your career in Japan a wonderful thing. Uh, and um, so lastly, there's always growth opportunities in Japan. Um, it is a flat market, yes, in general, but you've got to pick your battles, you've got to pick um, the areas, and that's where innovation comes in also. Uh, and uh, you, need to, you need to think, you need to ask help um, and, and consultants can often give you an insight into the market um, in a, from a bigger picture and help you develop those plans uh, and look at where you can head uh, in, this, uh, in this country uh, to grow your business and grow your career and, and grow your family. Well, this has been a fascinating journey. We've gone here from Indonesia to South Korea to Japan and the scale of business going what two and a half times I think you said the scale of, uh, of it was back in 2010 now it's even more it's even more yes even more and, and you know a huge population of people working in the company so adjusting that scale and also messaging uh, the humanity aspect you mentioned about opening up yourself uh, to the team and having that rapport these are very, very, very interesting insights. So I really like to thank Paul for sharing those with us. It's been absolutely fantastic. Greg, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for joining us. This has been another episode of Japan's top business interviews with the recently, so recently, ex CEO of Adidas Japan, Paul Hardesty. Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in our next program. Thank you for joining the Leadership Japan series. If you found the program useful, then tell your family, friends, and colleagues. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and share this podcast. You can contact me at greg.story at dalecunny.com. Lots of great stuff on our website, enjapan.dalecunny.com. Until the next episode, take what you thought valuable. Put it into action because idea application is what makes winners winners. So be one of them. Remember, I'm your corporate coaching and training guy here in Japan, ready to help you grow your business. <music>